Well, in just a few short weeks, New City Church will turn five years old. And so today on Practical Church Planting, we're going to share with you nine reflections we have as we look back of the first five years at New City Church. Welcome back to Practical Church Planting. My name is Brian Androsian. Sitting next to me is Dylan Dotson. And today we're going to give you nine ministry reflections as New City Church turns five years old. We're turning five in just a couple of weeks. That's right. And this episode is brought to you by The Church Co., the best, quickest, most mobile-friendly church website builder, thechurchco.com slash practical. You can get 40% off for two years, Mm. which is a very long time. Deal of a lifetime. Easter's coming up. Everyone's going to be checking out your website. So get a new website before Easter, thechurchco.com slash practical. Put practical in the promo code when you check out. And of course, you could just chat with them. You can see tons of examples on their mm-hmm. website. Our website, the Practical Church Planning website, we, we use have used uh, Church Go for many years now. Highly recommend them. And so check them out. They've got really good customer support so they can answer your questions. Just remember, practical is the promo code at checkout to get 40% off your first two years, which is a very long time. That's right. <laughs> if uh, web design... Uh, uh, intimidates you, then this is the place to go because yes. it's it's very plug oh, and play. So it's so simple and yep. it looks really good. Yep. So, um, and as we get ready for these New City Turning Five, it's also the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> College basketball, my That's favorite right. sport. We won't talk about Duke losing Coach K's last game at home, mm. but we're saying this because the tournament is starting. So if you are listening to this podcast in real time, so not later. Yep. This comes out on Wednesday, so either today or Thursday before noon. If you join, if you're in the Practical Church Planting Facebook group. We've got a bracket challenge. It's free. Enter. If you win, we will send you a $25 Amazon gift card. And I will also, if you want, uh, review one of your sermons and give you some coaching feedback. The caveat is you have to have a video. So if it's audio, I'm sorry. If you want that and you win, that's an option for you. Totally for free to give you some coaching for for preaching. But definitely an Amazon gift card. Anyone can get the Amazon gift card. Anyone can get the Amazon gift card. So Practical Church Planning on Facebook on our Facebook group, yep, and submit it before Thursday at noon. Yes. Listening to real time. So New City is turning five in just a few short weeks, which is pretty hard to believe. So we have nine reflections we want to share with you. I didn't tell Brian before we did this because I like to put him on the spot. Nice. The first five are mine, and the second four were Brian's. So as normal, I will introduce the first five, and then Brian's going to introduce his four. Oh, and he's okay. going to talk first. Oh, so. And I'll respond. There we go. Because, you know, he thought of them. So. I did. Sure did. Um, so here we go. Five, uh, nine reflections as we turn five the first Sunday in April is when we turned five years old, which is hard to believe. Pretty crazy. So here we go. Number one, it is better to have not than to have the wrong people leading. So I, that's the, the succinct way I could put that. <laughs> this is not to say it doesn't stink to have, don't have leadership and people and staff positions when you want them. But it's just, and it's one of those things that's easier I get said than done, but it's just so much better to not have something or not have a leader than put somebody in place that will really mess things up. Mm-hmm. Because it can cause a lot of damage. It's really hard to move people out of leadership positions that you've put in there, especially in like a church setting when everybody kind of knows it's kind of public, like who's in charge, and that can cause problems. And so as frustrating as it is, one of the things that we, I think, mentioned in our last episode about church planning assessments, or maybe two episodes ago, when talking to church planters, is um, that it's okay, It's better to to realize and to be okay with what you can do and and is not that you don't want to improve things or have more ministries or whatever, but to not let that bog you down or to discourage you all the time. You just have to be able to do what you can do and be okay with that. And of course, pray and and work towards better things, but don't feel the pressure that your church needs to be all things to all people when it can't be, especially Mm -hmm. in the beginning, if it's smaller, you know, budgets, all that sort of thing. So let me give you a really practical example of this. A week or two ago in our Facebook group, somebody posted asking for how to how to, how to do leadership and how to get leaders and how to run like like fifth and sixth graders. They have a lot of okay. fifth and sixth graders don't have anyone leading, and which is a legitimate question. Mm-hmm. And I almost commented, but I didn't because I didn't want to be one of those people that doesn't answer the question. <laughs> you know, that's like a yeah. Team. It's like, oh, have you thought this? Because it's a it's a great question, and and you should definitely. If that's a problem. Try to fix it. Yep. But what I wanted to say, which I felt like a Facebook comment didn't allow, was. Don't I mean yes, it's okay to want something for those age groups, and of course we want something too, mm-hmm. but don't let it overwhelm you in the sense of if you don't have somebody, you can only offer what you can offer. Yep. And it yep. is better to I know it stinks, and it's not it's not a it's not a win win scenario. I mean it stinks either way, but it's better to not have something for longer if you don't have someone that can lead it, mm-hmm. rather than just try to put something in place that could to not could not go well. So obviously you want to work towards that, but but not feeling like, oh, if we don't have this, like we're the worst ever. And so that's just one example. But whether, you know, it's leadership, staff positions, whatever it is, yes, you want to work, you want to develop leaders, you want to improve things, 
But just know from our wisdom of five years, we're very old. <laughs> um, it's better to not have somebody in place than to have the wrong people leading. Yeah, and just just so you don't think we're just um, kind of saying these things, but haven't lived it. We have yeah. we have lived on both sides of this, mm-hmm. where we we have we have put people in leadership positions that shouldn't have been, and it went poorly, <laughs> and then we have subsequently not had people in those positions, and so not been able to offer those things. Yeah, and. Unfortunately, like not not that that's ideal or what we want in the long term, but it has been it was better than when we offered them previously, if that makes sense. Yeah. So that, I'm kind of dancing around the actual thing, but but um, it, it it has definitely been much better to not offer something than to offer it and do it poorly or do it in a way that people are uncomfortable with yep. and things like that. And so, I mean, definitely be encouraged. Even even the things that you think you can't go without, if you have to go without them, you have to go without them. Yep. Like it, <laughs> it it can it can come down to almost anything outside of like preaching like if if you if you have no band you have no band like you can't (laughs) manipulate something and obviously we want to get to you want to get to the point where you do and and that's great but you you may not at first and that's totally okay or things with kids or whatever and you can't just you can't force something to happen and and oftentimes when you do force something to happen it ends up being a lot worse than if you would have just not done it in the first place so again of course it's not a reason to be lazy and not plan to strategize but to take the burden off but this goes for you know Elders, we talked about that in our last episode. Yep. That could go poorly. Staff, very fortunate for us that that's pretty gone well. We've had maybe two that didn't work out mm-hmm. out of, I don't know, how five years we've had various people. Yeah. But in the beginning, it was just, luck is not the right word, but in God's providence. Yeah. But it was like we had people that did well, and so it was just like, hey, you do this, and it worked out, which yeah. it could have gone a lot poorly because we just were desperate. And so <laughs> for future planters, I'd be like, make sure this is a good fit because... Yeah. For us, it was just whoever could do it, and we were, we were just fortunate that it was good and yep. not bad. <laughs> yeah, and so, but I mean, yeah. honestly, we we were fortunate for a while, and eventually, it yeah. did um, mm-hmm. not turn out great in in some cases. So, just because something's working at, at at one point doesn't mean it's going to work forever. And yeah. I mean, obviously, we learned that, and I think that's something you can learn if you just kind of uh, don't heed this advice. So, to encourage you, it's better to have not than to have the wrong people leading. It doesn't yeah. mean it's not difficult. But just wanted to share that with you. Number two, this will not be a surprise if you listen to this, is to be proactive in how you talk about money. This is one of the... Th- there are so many things you know I would do differently. Mm-hmm. <laughs> one of the things that we did well is we talked <laughs> about money a lot because yep. we didn't have a choice. And uh, and so talk about money a lot and not just raising money and asking for money, but from stage and not making it a big deal. One of the things we talk about often is not apologizing for it. Like it's just here. It's in the text. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about it. And just like you would any other teaching of Jesus or the scriptures or any other sin issue or whatever. It's just like, here's what it is. Now, for us, it's actually one of our values. You know, what do we say? Grateful people give. Like, yep. if you're a partner at New City, we ask and expect you to give financially. Mm-hmm. And every Janu- January, we, re- we kind of, re- re- for lack of a better word, have all of our partners re to say they're in again. Yeah. And if they're not giving, we say, hey, this is something we noticed in a lot, a lot better, nicer way than yeah. this. But hey... You know, what's going on? How are you doing? That sort of thing. Um, we don't ask people to give a certain amount. We don't obviously check their bank accounts to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, technically, you could get away with giving $10 a month. Yeah. And you could be a millionaire. Yep, which you sure I don't could. think that's happening. <laughs> so, but like, you know, it's just all that to say, you got to be proactive about it. Never apologize. You don't have, it doesn't necessarily have to be one of your values, but if you have a membership partnership process, I would encourage you to make that an expectation because this is their church. When it talks about it in the passage that you're talking about, it just talk about it like normal. Like, yeah. It's just a normal thing, but talk about money a lot. What often happens is you don't talk about money till it's too late, because people need mm-hmm. to hear about this a long time for it to really seep into your culture. But if you only talk about it when you need to raise money or when you need to move into a building or you need to buy something, it, it can seem very manipulative, manipulative, even if that's not your intent, yeah. rather as it's just something you talk about frequently and uh, it's not a big deal when you talk about it. Yeah, I think this is something that we've done pretty well, because not only are we not necessarily afraid to talk about it when it comes up in... Uh, you know, from the, from stage and things like that, but we're very transparent with our money. Yep. Um, where like quarterly, we, we send out giving statements quarterly instead of yearly, mm-hmm. but in those giving statements, we, we show basically exactly where the church is financially, how much we've yep. spent this year, what our budget was, if we're over, under, how much money we've brought in. And so it's, if, if you're a partner here, you know that we have nothing to hide financially. And yeah. so I think that helps it be a little bit less awkward I don't feel like it's awkward at all, but a little bit less yeah. awkward to people if we do talk about money because it's just something that we're not afraid to talk about. And people know, and obviously, I, you know, who knows how many people actually 
study the numbers and look <laughs> at them and stuff. But if we were starting to do pretty poorly financially, and when we talked about it from stage, it wouldn't be the first time people were hearing about it because they would see that maybe this is a trend of where it's heading if they're looking at it that close. Um, but being transparent with money, I think, has been really helpful to people, especially as a church who, you know, now we're five years in, I feel like it's not as big a deal, but early on, we were all in our 20s for the most part, yeah. the leadership. And so I think that really helped, especially in the beginning yeah. where we had older people coming showing that, hey, we're, we care about your money. We're being transparent with how we're spending it. We're not frivolous, frivolously spending it. And I, I think that helps build some trust, especially if you're a younger leadership team. Yep. And I don't know the episode, you have to scroll back a little bit. We've, we've, we have episodes on generosity. Mm-hmm. I think so. I think at least one of the last couple of months about how to how to raise money and talk yeah. about this sort of thing. But yeah, we talk about it. It's not an awkward thing. We're proactive about it, you know, with giving updates every quarter and that sort of thing and just saying, here's where we are. Yep. So be proactive in how you talk about money. Number three, uh, faithful pastoring is much more than preaching. Mm. I, I just think a lot of, particularly if you're uh, like the lead pastor or planter, you know, you can, I just remember in college when I was like, I think I want to do ministry and plant a church, you know, watching some of these more well-known pastors that were, I have respected and were helpful, kind of thinking like, oh, that must be nice that like every Sunday you get to <laughs> preach <Yeah. laughs> and like people listen to you and you don't really understand all that goes into it. And mm. it, it could just be very easy again in our social media digital age to think pastoring is all about a crowd and preaching the Bible. And while that is a very uh, significant or important part of, of what you do, if you preach regularly, um, I'll, you have to do a lot of other things that really allows you to do that and gives people the reason to actually listen to you. And so, again, I still think the intentions are good. I mean, we're all prideful and human, so it's hard not to maybe want people to listen to you. But I just remember getting into church planting and ministry, you know, thinking, oh, that would be, like, really cool to do that every week and not really realizing all that comes with it. And, again, yeah. with social media and, you know, you know, clips and YouTube, whatever, it's really easy to assume that planting a church is just – leading Bible studies and preaching every week, and everybody just comes to you and asks for your wisdom, <laughs> which is not yeah. at all how it works. And um, so, yeah, really learning how to care for people well. And I just, I guess I was just, not that I was naive in the sense of I didn't know that other things would happen, but you, if you have an experience that you just don't know, yeah. um, that to be a faithful and a good and pastor and ministry leader, regardless of what your staff role might be, if you preach consistently, it's much more than that. And I just remember thinking... Oh, like that's like the main thing to do, and it's important, but it's it's not really the only thing that you have going on. Yeah, especially in a, I mean, in, in any church size, obviously, but especially in a smaller yeah. church plant church size, like you can. We've we've talked about this before, but it's very rare that people will make your church their kind of home church or decide that's where they're going to go based on the preaching alone. Mm-hmm. There's generally there's a lot more that goes into it, mostly how the relationships they build there. But I think that I think people will view you as a. Um, I don't want to say like good or bad, but that's kind of that's kind of the sense of a positively or negatively <laughs> as a pastor. They'll, they'll base it on a lot more than just your yes. preaching. Yep. Um, and I think mm-hmm. that obviously, like you said, it's not an unimportant part, but you can find quality preaching at mm-hmm. the click of a button anywhere you go, yep. and that's not the only reason that people are going to come. And so, if you if you, if you're a great communicator, but people have a hard time getting a hold of you, you're not available <laughs> to like sit down and actually talk through things. Respond like, to your emails. Respond to your emails. You don't respond to your emails. <laughs> if someone wants to, you know, has an issue they want to talk to you with, and you're kind of unwilling or kind of cold when you talk to them, then I, then that's going to speak a lot more to how you are as a pastor than just if you're a good communicator. Yep. Yeah. So there's just much more that goes into it, and again, you don't know what you don't know if you're getting into it, but just mm-hmm. realizing. There's going to be a lot more to this than just preaching every week. And, uh, and yeah, so faithful pastoring is a lot more than that. Yep. Uh, number four, <coughs> excuse me, is less is more. And I mean this both in a ministry setting and in a personal life setting. Mm-hmm. I am still a sh- struggling to fully heed my own advice here. Sure. But I am I much better than I was even a couple years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, thinking that you've got to do a lot of stuff, you've got to have a lot of stuff going on, that if you, you know, have a don't have it have as full of a week, then you've somehow like less faithful and you've got to make up to it. So you've got to read more and you got to do all these things and just like feeling like if there's not a lot of stuff on the church calendar, which we've, we've never over scheduled things, but you know, we try to do generally speaking, like, you know, one church event a month, it's like a more of a fun thing. And yeah. if you don't have events coming, it's just various things you can feel like, I don't know, you're not being faithful and not, not, not a lot's happening. And, uh, yeah, I've just learned that, you know, you want to, and we'll talk about this more in a couple of these other points, but like a sustainable long-term pace, and actually that'll be our next, uh, next episode. That's right. That's what I'm looking at my notes yeah. here. <laughs> our next week's yep. episode is how to live in a sustainable pace. So we'll talk more about that in detail in the next episode. Um, 
but yeah, like I remember reading, uh, gosh, what's it called now by Eugene Peterson, Pastors to a, Letters to a Young Pastor mm-hmm. between him and his son earlier this year, which is like the first book I read this year, and it's I was like, oh, this is gonna be top five for 2022. Oh, nice. um, but I remember even him saying, <laughs> like encouraging his son to preach three times a month, mm. just every three weeks, and then take a break. And of course, I think that's different based on like your desire and that sort of thing. Like if you like to preach, I don't think, you, you know, if that's something that energizes you versus drains you, I mean, all those sort of things. Yeah. But it's just interesting listening to, you know, older, wiser people talking about the pace of life and how when we're younger, we feel like we've got to do all these things, but we're not getting the long-term view. And so being okay with not, again, have, offering a million ministries at your church, mm-hmm. um, but even in your personal life. And what I mean by this is like scheduling things that are important. So proactively scheduling, you know, date nights or things with your kids or vacations. What can often happen in ministry is I'm going to fit this in whenever it seems like it's available to fit in. Yeah. Instead of saying, oh, I'm going to plan it. Now, of course, you have to consider something. So it's not like you can be willy-nilly about this, but like I'm going to plan this vacation this time, and then I'm going to schedule my church life around it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that'll just help you me not burnt out. It'll help you not be angry and discouraged all the time because you've prioritized the important things. But working hard when you're working, but not over-scheduling and, and, and thinking more about the long-term view, not just like the next six months. Later. Which again, if you're a newer church or a smaller church, or if you're in a season where you're struggling financially, that can be really hard to do. Um, but yeah, just being okay with less is more, long-term pace, as opposed to just trying to do all these things the next six months and then being really burnt out. Yeah, I the church shouldn't be the only thing that matters in your life. And I, I think everyone agrees with that. But if you look at your calendar... It, that'll tell you if you agree with that or not. Um, like if if nothing, if if all you're ever scheduling is things for the church, or if all your conversations are around the church, obviously it's an important part of your life and it should be. But if if it's all consuming and all you're thinking about and talking about, then it's going to be a real quick road to burning out. Yeah. And it, I think that like every young pastor thinks they're um, the exception to that, mm-hmm. like immune to that, especially in the beginning because you want to, you know, this thing just finally got off the ground potentially if you just launched and you want to go at it fast and you want to, you know, it's, it's, it's fun at first. It's, it's, it's always fun, but it's, it's, it's extra fun at first and yep. it's kind of intense at times. And it, it can be like, you can think like, I'm not going to be burnt out or this is going to be perfectly fine, but it, it will come eventually. And so doing, doing less, I think is really helpful. And the, and the less you do, the better you can do at the things that you're doing. Mm-hmm. Like if you're constantly trying to do every different thing, things will be done poorly. Things are not going to be done in the way that anyone's going to want to be a part of them. And so if you, especially like church-wise, if you're focusing on just a few ministries or a few things that your church is doing and are doing them really well, people will be a lot more excited about that than if they can come and have just a, you know, a buffet of things that they can do or be a part <laughs> yeah. of, but that aren't run well. So yeah. do, doing less is always good. And one of the ways you can do this, we talked about this last episode, is being very proactive with your boundaries in terms of work boundaries, family boundaries, committing to how many ministry nights a week, because then that will force you to do to do less, and maybe you have to schedule more things out. Yeah. But it's like, no, we've said this is important to us. We're going to commit to the long term, not just, again, for the next six months or a couple of years. And so having some really solid boundaries in place will help you do less because you've said, here are the things that you know I'm going to do, here are the things I'm not going to do, so you can actually commit to it. Yep. And then the last one for me, number five, is to read more books from older people or older books. Sure. I've just yep. found this to be, especially this last year, to be, a, to be very encouraging because, again, we... The, the le- younger you are, the less experience you have, you can f- everything feels like it's such a big deal or the end of the world. And then you read people, you know, who's who have been older and have talked about, you know, like Eugene Peterson said in that book, I would have I would have done less. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, I would have I would I would have gone slower. Uh, it's just really helpful. And so it's one thing to talk about that, but it's one thing it's another thing to hear from people who have done it and have lived it. And so whether older authors talking about life and ministry or just maybe biographies, anything like mm-hmm. that, or books that weren't written in like the last 50 years. Yep. You, 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 then you begin to see that nothing is new. Like we always <laughs> like, like it's the craziest, there's the most divided time ever. I was listening to this interview, I forget what his name is, but anyway, this guy who just wrote a memoir and he was talking about how he's like 72 now and he's like, the, the, everyone talks about how crazy days. He's like, the sixties was awesome. Awful too. Like mm. he was in college in the sixties and he was giving all these examples. It's like, we just, we're very prisoners of the moment and we forget yep. and it can cause a lot of anxiety in us. And so reading books written by older people or books that are older, centuries older or whatever, helps you realize, oh, this is a lot of the same stuff is going on. We're not going to change the world. You know, I'm going to slow down and just be faithful where God has called me. Yeah. I think that the, this is a, uh... I'm going to kind of paint this with a broad brush, but hopefully you can get what I'm saying. I, th- there's something to be said for 
life experience, obviously. <laughs> but like there, there's, and this isn't to say like every book that's written by someone who's younger is not worth reading or that you should skip over. But I think it's, I think it's okay to have a sort of healthy skepticism towards mm-hmm. people that want to want to write in a sense of writing on topics like that they have as if they have a ton of experience and when they're super young because there's just things that come with life and experience especially in ministry that's not to say that nobody's ever written a good book at 25 years old like that's not what i'm saying but i think that it's really helpful to look at to look to people to take advice from that have really lived life because they know what is gonna or not necessarily what's gonna happen but they know kind of what life is and aren't just kind of writing on their little tiny sliver of life that they've experienced so far. Yes. And so whether that's ministry related or outside of ministry, I think it's really helpful, like you said, to read read books of people that have that have passed away or people that have lived these long lives and lives that are kind of very different than what you and I live. Um, and I think it really helps bring a new perspective on life itself, but on ministry as yeah. well. And I just, the wisdom is there, and I just have been, for whatever reason, just very encouraged as well as I've read them, mm-hmm. read, read these books. And so that's been helpful as well. And so... Yeah. Books from older people or older books. And I, and I would say, even to take this a step further, is things like podcasts and things like that that are... Now, obviously, these people would be alive, but like <laughs> that, of people that are older. And that might yeah. mean they're a little bit less like... in uh, What's the word? You know, modern or like super engaging. But yeah. um, I found like I found a couple that listen to... And yes, I, I get like it's not the mo- it's not the most... Uh, exciting thing as like the whoever's the as as us the young people um but i found just like some some interviews and people talking about their life experience and pastoring and things they just have a completely different view of things than we do yeah and they're talking about dealing with these like really terrible things that i've i haven't and maybe will one day i don't know but just the way they kind of talk about it in retrospect is like is very different than you'd hear someone kind of our age talking about it and not even to say that we would say things that are wrong. Hopefully we wouldn't, but just kind of looking at a, a whole career in ministry, looking back on it, you have a different perspective on it. So I, I would I would definitely say don't rule out people that are are older and just looking for the kind of young, more exciting people to listen to. Yep. So those are five ministry reflections that came to my mind as New City Turns Five. Brian, what came to yours? Number six. Number six. Uh, let's see. I said it's, it's better to focus on who you have than who you could have. And what I mean by that is th- there's a lot of different ways you can take it, but a lot of that is in uh, things like church attendance. It's very easy, and, and it, th- there's a there's a healthy way to do it and an unhealthy way to constantly be thinking about where you could be. And I think it is good to think about the future. I don't think it's good to just focus on the present, but I think that you can be thinking about how much you want to grow so much that you forget about the people that you have. Mm-hmm. And there's and I, and I think you can do your people a real big uh, disservice by just thinking about, whether you're talking about this publicly or not, I think it can be reflected, but by just thinking about how big of a church I want to have, yeah. while well, you're neglecting the needs of the people you currently have. And so, I mean, I think most of us would say this, that it's it's better to have a healthy small church than an unhealthy large church, but I think that the way we think and the yeah. way we act can sometimes uh, be the opposite of that. Yeah, and I think, too, even going back to the, the first point about better to have not than to have the wrong people leading. That's probably what gets, that's also what gets us in, in trouble because we want something that we don't have. And mm-hmm. so we're trying to throw th- people in there. And again, a lot of our discouragement is by comparing ourselves to others and saying, we don't have what these churches have. So we are somehow not faithful. Or we failed, or this hasn't turned out how I thought it would be, you know, by this amount of time. And uh, to, to disregard a lot of the good stuff that's happening in your church and to be encouraged by that and to focusing on that. And so the people that you do have, um, the type of ministries or whatever that you can run with what, what you do have and trying to be really faithful with that and really trusting that God has given you who he has given you for now to do what he wants you to do and not try to force. And again, there's a balancing act here because you should, there's nothing wrong with strategy and planning, mm-hmm. Yep. but uh, you'll be a lot more encouraged <laughs> yep. if you take a second to think about who God has brought you and what you can do with what you have while still maybe wanting other things, but working with what you have. Because I think to your point too, it can make people feel really uh, devalued if you're always talking about what you want to do and never celebrating and talking about what's happening here. It's yep. like people can feel like you're just trying to use us to get to your next thing as opposed to doing what God is have, having us to do in this moment. Yeah, I think that, and even if you're not saying things out loud, I think you can reflect that really easily by things like if it's a very low attendance Sunday, it, I think, and, and and that really gets to you. I think you can um, show that from the stage, like show that from your preaching or in your conversations with people. Yeah. And I get, like, I, I'm not trying to be unrealistic. Like, I get that can be discouraging, 100%. Yeah. And they're not trying to say it should never be discouraging. But 
are you viewing it as just we're not getting to the place I want to be as a church? We're not we're not you know going to get to this number, or are you viewing it as being thankful for the people that that came? And some of this, some of these things we're saying are easier said than done. Totally get it. And like you said, there's nothing wrong with wanting to grow, whether that's because you want to reach more people or because you have to to survive financially. Like that is a, le- a legitimate concern. But in that kind of stage of growth or stage where you're wanting to grow, are you valuing the people that you have? Mm-hmm. Or are you just seeing them, like you said, as a stepping stone to where you want to be? And I yep. think that people, I think people can see through that pretty quickly if that's how you're treating them. Yep. So it's better to focus on who you have than who you could have. Uh, point number seven, it's better to try new things that fail or don't last than to never try anything new. Uh, we could write a memoir of the things <laughs> that we've tried that's, I, I said fail or didn't last because some I wouldn't say failed, but yeah. we just didn't keep forever. Um, that you may think are crazy ideas, and maybe were in retrospect, but uh, for the vast majority of them, I, I think I'm glad that we tried them. Yeah, and they may have not have lasted or didn't didn't necessarily work. Than to just from day one just say we we meet Sundays, we have community groups, and that's the way church is. Yeah, and never try anything new. And so this this can this can be all kinds of different things, and and it can be things that can look a little bit crazy in retrospect, like we've done gosh um like all kinds of different video related things yeah. and and th- you know facebook live things back before anyone cared about facebook live and all these things that some of them were okay some of them weren't but i think it showed our people especially early on that we are, we want to come up with ways to engage you yeah. and that we're not just expecting you to come to us constantly but we want to come to you as well yeah this one is important it also can be a little double edged sword if sure every can. week <laughs> you're trying to do something new people can be like I can't. Like, what are you doing? Can't keep up. So one of the ways around this is, if you want to, if you want to do something new, again, one of the problems with churches is that we can take forever to try something hmm. or to do something. Like, if you know and your leadership knows, like, I would say, do it. Don't just wait six months. Like, yeah. try it. Um, but also, if you're one way to kind of circumvent the, oh, we try everything and everyone's like, gosh, you do, you guys like nothing you ever do sticks. Is, a, have some things that you do commit to long term, and B, when you try some things, they don't need to be some big announcement that we're doing this. <laughs> like, just do it, yeah. and if it works, you keep doing it, and if it doesn't, you stop. So, like, I mean, it's really a small thing, but, like, when we started doing those Facebook Live videos, like, it was, like, on Wednesdays or Thursdays or whatever, mm-hmm. like, there was not a big announcement. It wasn't a... We didn't say it from stage. We might have included it in our weekly newsletter. Yeah. But, like, if it's a smaller thing that doesn't require, I don't know, a lot of money or... I don't know, people to, to get behind or to start it, just do it and see how it goes, and then you can take it away yep. and not make everything seem like it's a really big deal. And also understand that not everything's going to work. Not everything that people say they're interested in is going to work, um, but doing things. And then if you stop doing things, you need to communicate it depending on how big it is. So one of the big things that we did for a couple of years was the $5 gift club, mm-hmm. and then we stopped doing it. And we couldn't just like stop doing it. We had to communicate like, you know, it's just not accomplishing what we want. Um, what we wanted to say is everyone who said they were excited about it it wasn't giving to it. We didn't say that. <laughs> yeah. But like it just wasn't turning into what we wanted to do. So we kind of explained what it is. And so talk about change. Have, uh, definitely have some things that you do long term. And then try definitely try new things. Don't wait forever. If, you, if you're feeling led to do something, give it a shot. And if it's something that doesn't require a now, big announcement to the church, just don't announce it. Just do it and see how it works. And then if it becomes a thing you want to make a bigger deal, you can. Yeah. But don't make every new thing you try some big announcement because then people will be like, Nothing, nothing you do sticks. Yeah. <laughs> and I think this really um, works for things that you... This really needs to be things that you and, and your leadership are excited about. I think those are the good new things to try. Not necessarily everyone that comes to you with an right. idea. You're yes. saying, let's be innovative and try whatever. Because you can. I think you can 100% innovate yourself to death and just constantly be trying new things. But if you're excited about it, if your leadership are excited about it, you know your church and you're probably your excitement probably isn't 100% unfounded. There probably is some good behind it. And so trying new things, I think... Um, is a really good idea and, and can and is and can keep things exciting for people. And and one thing I'll add is is trying new things can help uh, ministry not be boring. Yep. Um. And I not and I think it can keep you from just like getting in a rut of always doing the same thing, which can be easy to get into, especially if things are working kinda. Um. But trying different things like right, right now, one of the different things that we do is we do these uh, like online Bible studies. Yeah. And they're they're not these. They're not these like big revolutionary things, but it's just something new that we're doing. And we're doing it for now. I don't know. We'll yeah. do, maybe we'll do it forever. Maybe we'll stop at some point. But we're, it's it's not something that took like a whole big ton of planning, but we're looking, especially during COVID, to engage people more, not just on Sundays. And that was something we landed on. And one thing that um, we were told 
at the beginning of COVID, or I was told by a guy who goes to our church, which he meant it as a compliment. <laughs> and I took it that way too, but it may not sound like it at first, but we were trying just all these different things because for a time we were shut down and he, and he, we were talking and he was like, you know, it seems like you guys are just kind of throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. Mm. And at that time, this, that wasn't obviously appropriate for any time, but at that time I was like, you know what, that's kind of what we're doing because we want to figure out what's going to engage people. And we're not afraid to try something that doesn't to, to get to that thing that does. And I think that if you can do it in a healthy way, we're not not overworking yourself like some of these other points we said, but you're going to try some things that fail and it's going to be the stepping stones to finding out what actually will engage people. Yeah. We've had this in the past. This might sound self-serving, but it's not that if you and your leadership are excited about it, that's a good indicator that you should try it. Yeah. Maybe not just you individually, <laughs> yeah, but true. like if the leader and the leaderships are leadership is excited about something, people are just going to buy in because of the passion and the energy, yeah. whether if you do something out of force. So I remember that. And also to encourage you too, when it comes to trying new things, just to remember that your people aren't thinking about your church like you are all the time. Mm. They honestly don't really care. <laughs> like, so sometimes we'll be like, yeah. well, what are they going to think if we do that? Like people... People are sheep. We're sheep. Mm -hmm. Like, we'll, we just go with whatever people do. Sure. And as long as it's, like, done well and it's somewhat consistent, like, people are good with it. And so don't worry about what is everyone going to think if we try this thing. Like, they're good. Like, people just don't care. Yep. Like, they, you've got relationships. This is my church. What do you want to do? If it sticks, great. If not, not a big deal. But don't feel like this pressure of what everyone's going to think if we do this. Most people don't care. Yep. Yep. That's true. So it's better to try new things that fail or don't last than to never try anything new. Uh, next up, Sunday morning attendance isn't the best indicator of people's faith and dedication. And by de dedication, I mean to the church. Um, yeah. That we uh, during COVID, people definitely swung. I think <laughs> swung hard one way or the other. Of like Sunday morning is the only thing that matters, or Sunday morning doesn't matter whatsoever. So definitely not going far enough to say like Sunday morning doesn't matter because I yeah. still think it's very important. But I don't. It, I don't think that's the necessarily the best indicator of how someone's doing in their faith or if someone is dedicated to the church. Um, we definitely saw a, 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 a small amount, not a huge amount, but a small amount of people that, I mean, obviously didn't come while we were shut down during COVID, didn't come for a period after that, that we assumed were completely disengaged that have since come back and engaged yeah. really well. So one thing we, we kind of figured throughout this whole time is that it's really a, one way to kind of help track people's, uh, 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 it, like engagement in their faith and dedication to the church is how much they're attending community groups. Now we're not tracking that in place of Sunday morning, but in yeah. addition to, so I think if you're just looking at Sunday morning, if that's the only thing that you're looking at attendance wise and how many people are showing up, then I think that you're kind of missing some other ways to really look at what's going on in people's lives. And if they're dedicated, not just to their faith, but also uh, to the church as well. Yeah. I mean, we're big, we're big, obviously pro on the online stuff, which mm -hmm. we talk about a lot. We have a lot of episodes on social media and that sort of thing. But we're also very big on the physical gathering. Like yep. that we don't think online replaces that at all. <laughs> yep. And it can really lead to a very shallow intellectual only faith if it's just content you, re you receive and you don't actually live it out. Um, and so we think that's important. But also that to say, so before COVID, I mean, we know people don't go to church every time, uh, every week, but it was mm -hmm. still like a somewhat good indicator, obviously without after COVID, to encourage you not to just be the, like completely against your people, is tracking things, you know, like we've, our giving units have gone up, mm -hmm. <laughs> giving units, no people have give, yeah. <laughs> unique people that give, um, our, our community group attendance and people in groups has gone up, even if our physical attendance is not yet what it was pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. And so that shows us that there is some engagement going on there. I mean, we do the live stream, I and mean, we, we try to be clear that this is a supplement, not a substitute. Yeah. But there's there's other things that you got to consider, again, depending on where you live. I mean, we live in Raleigh, so there's a lot of white-collar jobs, so people can travel a lot. And mm -hmm. so that has affected us, because work from home, go wherever you want. Yep. Um, but realizing, you know, while it can be discouraging that just because people... Now, it could be that people don't care as much, that's why they're not showing up. But sure. for a lot of people, it's not. It's the flexibility of life, and it is what it is, and so we want to do things to encourage people to be in community. Um, but yeah, Sunday attendance itself is not a, necessarily an indicator of someone's faithfulness or dedication to what's going on. Yeah, not not at all saying stop tracking it or yeah. stop paying attention to it, but maybe look for other metrics as well to look at on top of it to really get a better picture of how people are doing. Yep. Um, then lastly, the last point I have is having a high-quality online presence is easier than you think. Now, if you've listened to us for more than like half of an episode, you may have gotten this before, but we are big proponents of not just online content, not just being present online, but also that it is far easier than you think. Yep. And it's far easier to be, it's it's not a competition between anybody. It's not about being better than the church down the street, yep. but it's far better, or I mean, I'm sorry, it's far easier to be better than <laughs> the vast majority of churches um, 
it's far easier to do that than, than you think yes. it is because there are services that do a lot of the content for you. Um, even, even which uh, you, you use that more so you can talk more about it, but even going beyond the, the kind of um, services that help you create content, just creating content yourself, if you take a little bit of time to plan, if you are, are proactive in what you're doing, if you think through it, it's easier to come up with things than you think it is. Yeah. And it doesn't take fancy cameras. It doesn't take super high quality equipment and it doesn't take a ton of time, but it's just a matter of planning out, not trying to do things at the last minute or off the cuff. But if you plan out what you want to do, you can you can be really, really good online. And not just to be good online so people will say that, but to actually engage people during the week and, and help people see what the church is like. Um, and just doing that is far easier than I think a lot of people realize. Yeah, people think I think people think online engagement is a talent when it's a skill. Yeah, like it's not something you're just innately good at. It's like something you can develop. And so for us, there's a lot of services that are helpful. So for example, right now we use Sunday Social, which is really cheap. I would recommend. I don't know exactly outside, outside my head what it is, but super affordable. Mm-hmm. And they give you a bunch of graphics. There's a lot of them. I you know I don't use a lot of them, but we try to have a post a day for our social media for Facebook and. Instagram, Twitter is kind of like, eh, not as much, but we, we do our videos. We post them on there. Yeah. Um, now, it might sound like a lot, but combined with some of the stuff, we've been doing this for a while, so some of the stuff we do every week, and then some of those stuff, or then it's just some fun engaging posts. I mean, you if you, on your calendar, say, take two hours, it, it, it will not take you two hours, but just to, <laughs> once you get used to this, I mean, you could do this in 45 minutes a week, yeah. um, and you can schedule for a whole week, is like, I'm going to plan the next six days. Maybe take Saturday off, whatever. The next five days, six days, whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm going to post a one uh, one thing. Here's a good practical episode on Facebook and one thing on Instagram. Mm-hmm. It could be an Instagram like picture thing or it could just be a story. Either way is fine. And I'm going to plan out what I'm going to do. And then you can do things like we've talked about Bible in a minute, which is like a, around a minute of us explaining a Bible verse. Yep. We also take uh, a, a, a clip from the sermon, typically around the bottom line, which is also about a minute long. We, put, we upload those on different days of the week. And so we have some regular stuff that we do every week and then we have some fun stuff again it can be engaging but it's it does not have to be hard like buy, like do sunday social or social or what pro church tools also has one uh, i think there's a little bit more expensive it's probably better but it's more expensive yeah um where you can get content and then you can start figuring out what works and what doesn't if you want a free guide on practicalplanting.com if you sign up for our newsletter we send out a brief newsletter once a week it takes you like a minute to read although you can unsubscribe if you don't like it, it wouldn't hurt our feelings <laughs> but if you sign up we will send you our church planner's guide to social media which is literally practical breakdown of what to post we have episodes on what to post uh, on on this podcast mm-hmm. of how to post and it's just like it, it seems overwhelming to begin with but if you just start and do it it is so much easier than you think and you don't have to have the most amazing stuff but as you post, you'll figure out what works and what doesn't, and you'll figure out a rhythm. But you've got to start. You know, you can't just keep pushing it off because it, it makes a big, bigger difference than I think most churches realize. Yeah, and and I'll even take it a step further. If you are on, you know, social media and things are going okay, then I would challenge you to create to be present on YouTube as well. Yes, and it is much easier than you think. And this is this is where I see so many smaller church plants just. Um, absent from mm-hmm. or not there at all and i think people don't realize how how easy things can be granted you have to have a camera um but it, yes. if if you do and you like record your services then you automatically have something to upload right there your recorded service it, take five minutes and learn iMovie which you can learn in a two minute tutorial yes cut out a ser- uh, sermon clip there's two days worth of content yep. what we do we do it we do an online bible study you don't have to do that but that's just another idea and an easy way to do that is take a if you've been around for more than you know a few months Take an old sermon series and talk through some major points of a book you went through in the past. Like yep. right now, we're going through Esther, and Dylan is taking his previous points. Literally, and... <laughs> I'm taking my sermon notes without all of my points. Yeah, and I'm just talking about. I'm just like doing a Bible study, just like explaining. And then at the, the end, yeah. I give three points. Yeah, like I don't. I don't do stories. I don't do. And, yeah. and it's content already had. Yeah. So it's a way to recycle that same content because no yeah. one, very few people are going to go back and listen to old sermons. Is it interesting? Interesting point because the YouTube thing is great. I forget what it is. We have like eight YouTube tips, like six months or so ago, mm-hmm. and you can go on our. Pra- you can, so here's what I would say, not to cut you off. I, I have a You're thought. Good, yeah. If you go to New City RDU, which is our Facebook YouTube channel, you can see what we've done. Yep. And it's a lot easier than you think. Just copy it if you want. Yeah. Um, but we have an episode on eight YouTube tips. I forget what it's called, but you can search it on YouTube or scroll back on our podcast feed. Yeah. It tells you exactly what we do. Um, but it's so fascinating to me. So our sermon, our Bible studies are anywhere between 15 to 20 minutes. Sermons are typically 30 to 35 minutes. Mm-hmm. But like the Bible studies get so many more views. Yeah. This is why we do them, because <laughs> yeah. it grows our channel. Um, not necessarily from our own people, mm-hmm. but just for YouTube itself. And I think, I don't know why, I guess it's because it's like, 
people type Bible study, they don't type sermon. But like uh, I've done it, we, our Colossians one is our biggest one. Mm-hmm. We did one on James. We didn't do a sermon series on James, but that one that one's big too. But like we did yeah, a sure. we did a sermon series sermon series on Colossians, mm-hmm. and then I did a Bible study in Colossians. And uh, the Bible study in Colossians is our biggest playlist by yeah. far. Like some of these some of these videos has over 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 a thousand views, which is a lot for us. And it's like the same stuff. Yeah. It's just, in my opinion, not my. It's it's more boring. It's just the Bible study. Yeah. But people search Bible study, and now we're doing Esther. We'll see how that goes. You know, it, it, sometimes it takes some time for it to take off, and yeah. we we don't have expectations that could not be viewed by a lot of people. It's whatever. It's not the end of the world. But literally taking the sermon, just the sermon notes, saying Bible study, people watch it. Yeah, and I, it's 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 kind of it's kind of a bummer how many churches either, I mean, are absent from it completely, or the channel is just each week's live stream and nothing else because it, there's it, i think there's such an it's such an easy yeah. place to engage people it's an easy place to point your people to if you have engaging content on there um and it's just it's it's a lot less difficult than i think people think but it's it's video which you have to do and i think that can be intimidating to people but honestly yeah. there it's if, a, like it's a skill you it's just a, start doing it's it it's a skill to learn and honestly if you have a phone that <laughs> came out post 2016 maybe <laughs> you have a good enough camera yeah. like turn it horizontal don't record it vertical and press record and sit in front of it and cut out the part where you walked from behind the camera to in front of the camera. Yes. And you're fine. Like it does not need to be something super fancy. Make sure you're sitting in a room that's not super echoey and then you're good. And yes. you can start from there and, and get better from there. Right. But you don't have to wait until everything's perfect to start. It's good to start somewhere than to wait until you've got it all figured and out. And it's best to start now too because you're not going to like your first stuff you make anyway. So <laughs> that's true. get comfortable that's true. talking just to a camera. Get comfortable having basic edits. I mean, very small incremental changes over time. You can watch a bunch of YouTube videos on how to do it, but until you actually do it, you, you don't you don't know. Yep. And one other thing that's really helpful about this is I think it really shows that you're trying to be proactive with your people and that you don't view social media and the church as something you're just trying to get from people. Yeah. So when we do these Bible in a Minutes or these Bible studies that most of our people don't watch, but they see it every week and they see it in our newsletter that it's there, it's like, oh, kind of the comment during COVID, like people are seeing that we're proactively trying to engage with them. Mm-hmm. And I just think it... It makes their overall view of their church a lot higher. They know it's not about just trying to get them to come so that they'll go give and get the numbers. It's like, no, they genuinely are trying to do whatever they can to help me in my faith. And even if I don't watch all the stuff and do all the stuff, it's just nice to know that they're trying. And I just think whether or not people will ever verbalize it, I do think their respect and their admiration for their church does increase when you mm. do these videos because it shows that you're just trying to help them. You're not trying to come to this thing or come to my church or come to this event. It's like, we're just trying to help you, and here's a way to do it. That's right. And there's there's like literally nothing that we get from it. <laughs> you know, we don't, obviously, we don't, we don't like monetize our YouTube channel or anything like yep. that. And there's, it is literally just an avenue to give to people. And hopefully, I mean, yeah, sure, it's nice when like subscriber count grows, but like, that we we have no plans for that. Like, it's right. not like we're once we get to a certain point that we're going to start doing something crazy. But we just want to give content to our people, and obviously, if it helps people outside of the church, that's cool too. But it's it's literally just an avenue to give to people, which I think people really appreciate. Yeah. So speaking of too, with speaking of YouTube, our our practical church planning YouTube channel just hit 900 subscribers. As that's it's right. Recording, and I just say that to say it's the same content. You can watch this or you can listen to it. But it, sometimes we mention in these episodes, hey, we've done an episode on this. It might be easier to go to our YouTube channel that's and search true. like eight YouTube tips, and it'll tell you the exact number. And then you can watch it on YouTube, or you can just go on the podcast app, whatever you use. But if you ever hear us re- reference something, go to our YouTube channel and uh, search it. And then you can find the podcast episode number. That might be easier than scrolling. That's a good point. Yeah, that's a good tip. So those are nine ministry reflections as New City Church turns five. That's right. That's what we've learned. A couple of things we mentioned in this episode. Again, if you're uh, listening to this or watching this real time on our Practical Church Planning Facebook group, make sure you join the March Madness Bracket Challenge that we're using. Free $25 gift card if you win. And if you want and you win and you have a video, I will do some preaching coaching for you for free. Yep. And to churchco.com slash practical, check them out. Having a really good website is really important, especially if you want new people to come to your church and you want to be clearly explain what it is. You can also go to our YouTube channel and search, what should I put on my website? Because we have <laughs> episodes on what to do with your website. Yep. And the, and the Church Co. makes it really easy. So the churchco.com slash practical and put practical promo code at checkout for 40% off for two years. That's right. So thanks for listening. We'll be with you next week on Practical Church Planting.